What are we talking about? We've we already had that episode title. No, I'm aware, but what are we talking about? Well, uh, I'm Chris, and you're Jay, and welcome to the Grumpy Dungeon Masters. Oh, that's the worst fucking intro ever. Yeah, but it was an intro. Uh, I guess. I guess. Jeez. That was pathetic. <laughs> like, fuck it. I feel Craig could do a better intro by himself than that garbage. Yeah, it's a thing. You just gotta get with it. And so Craig, I have a couple... And, and, and the only thing Craig says ever is, now recording. Yeah, it doesn't even do it like a rhyme. That's hmm. bad. Anyway. So there's a couple things I want to talk about. A couple things I want to talk about last week. Um, yeah, so uh, now now that you're back on the show and yeah, you're, you're the, you are the victor of your battle with COVID 2021 <laughs> or whatever the fuck you had. I just had a cold. Uh, yeah, a, cold a cold that put you, you know, un, out of action for four days. I mean, it doesn't take it doesn't take much to get me out of action. Just like a pizza, you know, a pumpkin pie. I'm Look, out of pumpkin, action. For a pumpkin a pie will put me out of action. Let's be real. <laughs> um, so there was a. The first thing that, that I wanted to bring up was a a post on RDM Academy that I saw, and it was really the opening statement says this. It says being a good DM isn't about the power over the group. It's in the relationship you have with your group. And I didn't really need, I don't, we've kind of talked about this in the past a lot, but it just, it, it's weird to me that this, it has to keep coming up over and over again. You know, like I, I get it that there are some people out there who just are going to be bad DMs who are not going to ever understand the, the relationship of the DM to the player is not one of, I'm trying to win the game. You're trying to win the game. You know, some people have to learn that lesson the hard way. But this post has like hundreds of replies, you know, kind of all kind of echoing the same thing. And I'm just wondering if people just don't get it. Maybe there's a better way to approach how how to talk about being a DM, or like what it really is. Because it does. it seems like... It's the one thing we bring up a bunch. It's the one thing everyone else kind of brings up the bunch. Like, it's a mentality that has to be learned, you know. But people still don't seem to get it. I, I would I would imagine the vast majority of people who don't get it are new to dungeon mastering. Yeah. So is, so is it just, like, get in there and DM a few times, learn that you're doing it completely wrong, and well, learn to I, do it again? I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I can absolutely speak for myself and that's that's what i had to do you know it took me years years to get good at dungeon mastering it wasn't an overnight thing and even now i know you know, i've been doing it for god fucking 30 years at this point i know i can still be better than i am uh but like what the uh the thing said you know it's it's about the dynamic between you and your players that is that's straight up fact like yeah. it, you know, it is not about you. It's not about the players. It's about how you and the players interact together. Uh, some people might not ever quite understand that. Uh, those who, can, especially DMs, who can't figure that out, they're not going to be dungeon masters for real long. Or if they are, they're going to be constantly swapping groups as groups try to get rid of them and find somebody who actually is, you know, willing to work in tandem with the players. Yeah. I don't know. I just, the groups that I've had, that I've DM for, I've always seemed to had, I've always seemed to be maybe just be lucky and had that dynamic. Of course, the Adventure League stuff that I did for those years that I did it was very different. You have to approach it very I'm just running a game and I'm not changing anything from what the adventure league module says or the book says. Yeah. And you just run it as such roll a die in front of everybody. So they know you're not changing the values. Oh my God, you didn't really crit me. Brr. You know? Uh, well, that, that is that the, in, with adventure league, that's probably the case. Uh, yeah. When, when it so comes I, to your group, you have to, like there has to be that level of respect between the dungeon master and the players of not having to see everybody's roles. Yeah. 
I mean, so just I just I guess I'm just very lucky, and 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 the players that I've had, uh, or the, I guess the majority of the players that I've had, no matter what I'm doing, have always been very good, very open and honest with issues and questions they may have, and I I think I can get a lot out of them from a role play perspective, especially the people that are on the stream. They do really well. Um, I killed two of them this weekend, by the way. <laughs> See. I- that's not even necessarily the best way to phrase that. You know, it's <laughs> I I killed two of them. That's like you were trying to is how that sounds, even yeah. if it's not the case. No, it definitely wasn't the case, but it definitely is a thing that happened. And streaming streaming the games is very interesting um, because there's a lot of different dynamics I have to. I, ha, I, I there are definitely the flaws that I have as a DM are so much more apparent to me. Mm-hmm. when i'm streaming a game than if i'm playing at the table because like i still can't read most words it seems <laughs> um your, your english skills not so good huh no it's it's definitely got a negative modifier and uh you know i i still lack like i always forget to describe the room that people are in you know i usually just like default to the map and whatever the blurb on the on the book says and that's about it yeah, I keep I keep failing to give really good flair. You know, my wife told me when we started that I have to be extra descriptive with how weapons work and how weapons hit, but not all the time. I have to find the right balance. So I really she's, focused on that to begin with, and I think I got that balance right. She, she's not wrong. So yeah, one, you know, I I don't like to you know talk much about critical role because it's it's its own thing. But that is one thing Matt Mercer does very, very well is descriptions. Mm-hmm. Like he, you know, if you go back and watch the very first episode of season two, and I'm sure he had all this written out, but he goes through this long you know, five straight minutes of just flair of this description of you know where everything is and what's going on. And a lot of times they enter a tavern. It should never just be a tavern. You have to use fucking adjectives. You know, you 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 enter through the front doors. They swing wide open. You know, you catch the smell of cooking meats over the fire. The, you know, the wafting brews that are spilled all over the floor. You know, however, you want to describe it. That, that's actually a good thing that I should look up myself. Is quick descriptions. There's probably just a list of easy descriptions for locations out there. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely something that I I fail at doing that quite a bit. Um, like especially when we were doing ten towns and go, okay, you're now at the Caracona again. If it's not like an end that I'm very f- familiar with, you know, like I, you know, I have that data in front of me and I can read it off pretty quickly. It it's something that I keep failing at. But like, so the situation where I killed the two players, it was the last room of a hold of of a dungeon in Rhyme of the Frostman and. And I knew that this room was important and I knew it had a bunch of, you know, chance, it had a very good chance to kill the players. Yep. So I made sure to really talk up the not risk. the room, the room, the room I read the, dis- the, read the description, I gave them, you know, the options and the things that were going on. They didn't really care much about the room. So I continued, you know, the, the room, dis- the room, Let's just say trap, I guess, for lack of a better word. It, effectively, it is like yeah. obviously we aren't going to talk much about it, but it basically is a trap. And so I explained what happened in great detail, and you know I, I added a bunch of flair to it, and you know definitely kind of made it a moment that happened right at the end too. I was trying to trying to time it for like the last thing that happened. And I was thinking just one player would, would do would, would, would do this in that room and um the whole party decided just to do it and I was of just course like they did. Of Are course you guys sure? Did. Please yeah. don't. Yeah, that see and that's what that's that's the standard DM uh, you know, where you're explaining how bad this could be is when you say, Are you sure? I guess I guess that's the the key thing. I always say, "Are you sure?" Before yeah, if you say if you does. say, "Are you sure?" That is immediately telling the players, "Oh, this could be a terrible idea." So yeah, um, and 
one of the things that I had to do with stream is a uh, suggestion to a couple of the people who've done D and D streams have done is like, you have to keep the, the chat involved. So as, as you watch the stream, you accumulate chat channel points. And with those channel points, I, you can now buy advantage inspiration and a critical hit for the players during the game. So my wife's character is one that died again, but, but chat decided, Nope, we're going to make sure she gets it. And they spent 5,000 points to buy advantage. But mind you, you only get like 220 points per hour watched. So someone dropped 5,000 points just immediately to give her a nat 20 on the save. And then someone else gave her advantage, and then someone else gave her inspiration on top of that. And Just fucking guaranteeing <laughs> that she's gonna live. <laughs> she still failed, but anyways, no, she that that was enough to pass, and I I, I like that aspect of it because it kind of pushed a little bit of the DM wiggle mm-hmm. that we're, we we have and pushed it onto chat. Like this the. Does the audience think that maybe she saved the, got the save instead of, you know, failure? You know, yep. things that we do sometimes, you know. One thing that was cool, I just want to bring this up. It's in similar to the discussion. Uh, have you seen Dungeon Run at all? No. The, the show, okay, the YouTube show. It's kind of, it's basically like Critical Role. And when they first started doing it, they were doing it live uh, because of COVID. I don't know the exact formats of it at this point. Uh, but one thing that pl- uh, people viewing it could do would actually be to buy things for the players. So mm-hmm. you you start watching the first episode, and twenty minutes in, a serving wench comes in with a drink for one of the players that was actually bought by one of the viewers <laughs> you know because they were in a tavern so I, just a cool little dynamic there of allowing interactivity from the the viewers yeah i've seen a couple different D streams that have you can spend uh, bits which is real money yeah that like you can give to the channel to buy inspiration and crits and stuff for players i i don't i don't like that definitely just feels wrong to me now you're sure. kind of like making people, you know, pay to pay to win. And I, I don't like that at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, with, I don't mind your, the channel points. Yeah. With the channel points, uh, as well as giving advantage, uh, like you, you have a hard limit on how many times a, a single player can receive these benefits throughout the course of a game. So I don't feel well, it's the, too bad. Right now it's like, yeah, any, any person in chat can give one advantage and one inspiration per session but it's only one crit for the whole game. So that is actually an interesting thought. Now, uh, even offline, not streaming or anything, there's nothing that says a DM couldn't put in a system. Like they already have, uh, what do they call inspiration that you can earn through good role play or for whatever reasons the DM decides, but there's nothing that says you couldn't create a system that as players do heroic deeds, or complete tasks, they earn a certain amount of points that could then be used at specific times. You spend a certain amount of points to get yourself advantage on a roll. You spend another amount to get a nat 20, like you've said, or possibly even utilize them uh, when you are at larger cities or locations where it's possible to buy things to obtain objects that you would want. You know, a, a method to get sort of magic items. So I'm guessing you didn't read the variant rule for hero points. Uh, is that in the DMs guide? Yeah. No, probably not. <laughs> so it's it's an option you can toggle on, and I think D and D Beyond has it as well too. It's just buried. You you let someone have hero points, and with the option, a character starts with five hero points at first level. Each time a character gains a level, he or she loses any unspent hero points and gains a new total of equal to five plus half the character's level. A player can spend a hero point whenever he or she makes an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. The player can spend the hero point after the roll is made, but before any results are applied. Spending the hero point allows the player to roll a d6 and add it to the d20, possibly turning a failure into a success. A player can only spend one hero point per roll. Um, In addition, whenever a character fails a death saving throw, the player can spend a hero point to turn a failure into a success. 
So it's not entirely what you wanted. Yeah, that seems what, a little simplistic, but it's on yeah. the same same lines. Yeah, same same line. Uh, my friend, my friend, uh, my DM friend Sam in Germany specifically plays with hero points because uh, okay. he feels that it it takes the game to an epic level. Uh, a high level fantasy kind of setting yeah. where the, the the heroes are essentially just superheroes. Right. And I kind of like the more grittier aspect of everything. Um, like I want to go the opposite route and play with the realism rules where a short rest is a, an eight hour rest and a long rest is a week's yeah. worth of downtime. Yeah. I did read <laughs> that. I did read that rule. <laughs> Uh, I like I, that one I am, a lot. I am actually much more of the type of DM who plays my character. Like, I want my characters to be fucking superheroes. Uh, yeah. my, like, if I hand out a starting stat block, it's 18, 16, 14, 12, 12, 10. Like, yeah. I don't want negative stats for my char- my players. Definitely try out hero points. It works real well. So it's not too hard to manage. You know, five... 5d6 essentially that you get to add at any time and I mean, I have, uh, i've got a new campaign starting up here in about a month and a half or so once once all of my players get their covid shots then at that point it'll be a little while but uh, at that point i might consider implementing something like that um i think what he did too is that if the hero point on the attack roll made it above 20 it was an auto crit as well uh, that seems a bit that, much <laughs> that may be a bit much, but I'm not sure if he's did it or someone else. I saw someone else that wanted that did that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, if you just want a lot of a lot of combat and the and the players just wrecking through stuff, that's how you do it. Yeah, see, I've always sort of just handed out magic items a lot more freely as a means to do that. But part I kind of found out that was a problem in fifth edition. Uh, fifth edition is real weird about magic items. So in third edition, if you had a buttload of magic items, it didn't really matter because your characters yeah. are already kind of fucking awesome. Uh, so magic items, you're just a little extra icing on the cake. In fifth edition, you know they have a hard cap of three. Basically, you have three items you can attune to. All the ones you can't attune to are really fucking minor items usually. Uh, when I ran my a previous campaign for fifth edition, the first campaign I ran, the Hobtown one, I didn't have any attuned items. It was just, you can use however many you want. And it makes a big damn difference in 5e. Like, not having a limit on how many they can have access to makes a massive difference, especially when you're able to buy magic items. Yeah, so I I noticed, too, that um, there was a knee-jerk reaction from 4th edition to 5th edition, where in 4th edition, your character's have to have magic items. There's eight slots. You have to have magic armor, magic weapons, magic helmets, magic spears, magic helmets. Magic helmets, magic spears. And because that's how the game is balanced. If you don't have the plus one sword by the time you're at level five, you're you're falling behind on the uh, AR and A, the attack rating and the attack damage for... Mm the monsters like if you play dark sun you actually have to toggle on a variant rule that adds those num- number values number values in to your character sheet in order to keep you at the same level whereas fifth edition is so balanced around that floating ac value and not having magic items that any magic items seem to just overpower a campaign yeah that's that with that hard limit of three uh the hard limit of three is a problem as you go up in levels. It really is. But uh, up until about mid mid level of the game, it's kind of keeping things in balance. Like yeah. I've, I've yet to call, I find a proper way of not having that hard and not having that cap of three on there. But yeah, I don't like the cap, but I also don't want to overpower the game by handing out too much stuff. I think yeah. the proper method to do that is just get rid of the cap, but control how many items go out. I like the cap. I, I like as a player, I like the cap, but like having to choose between this, that, or the other thing, and it it, it feels good having the three feels really good because there's plenty of magic items that don't take up a binding slot. Like yeah. your basic plus one weapons and your um. You know, but your, as, your as you get up, in, once you get up to 
13th, 14th, 15th level, like there's a lot of cool stuff that you would possibly be able to have access to that you're just not able to because you have to have this other shit. Yeah, but but that only matters if they actually have a campaign setting for 12 and above, which they don't, so it doesn't worry about that. Well, okay, most people actually run homebrew, so just saying. Ah, what's a homebrew? Yeah, yeah, like I think you're the first DM I've ever met who actually just runs written stuff. Well, I think we, we, we had the discussion plenty offline. I've, I've mostly run, I've mostly run, run written things. However, I let my players do whatever they want to do. Yeah, I know, but you're still so running. The, my, the, my Frostwind campaign, my Icewind Dale Frostwind campaign is just a homebrew at this point in time. I'm just referencing is. things. It is, but at the same time, they're not able to buy magic items. So that's a hard rule that's in there not because it's not a homebrew. Eh, I probably wouldn't let them anyways. They're an Icewind Dale. There's nothing there. I mean, at the, yeah, I'm not going to say anything, but yeah, yeah, there's really not much there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so speaking of uh, homebrew campaigns versus normal campaigns, you are running Icewind Dale now, and you specifically let your veteran players of decades, years time spending. Some of them. Playing, some of them yes. Yeah. Accumulatively, probably a lifetime. And you're not changing a single thing in the book. You're running I, it directly as is. That is not 100% true, but that is... 80%? The, uh, probably 90. Yeah, like 90% 90. 90 of it is straight out of the book. It's so whatever the and, stats are, it's whatever they've got. Uh, I have changed a, a handful of little things over the course of it. And your players are just dominating everything there. Uh, for the most part, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, that wasn't the case. Even long-term experienced players early on, I mean, you know, half the party died in one encounter. So yeah. at the point they're at now, yes. I'm running, my campaign has got a lot of lower lower experienced players, mid-experienced players, and, and, and senior players. And I'm changing everything all the time, encounter-wise. I'm pushing things up, pulling things down, adding things, retooling whole sets of encounters to, to make it interesting. Not only for the stream, but because I guess just my experience running campaigns. I, I, I know I, would like, I, know I, I have would to like do to, that. I want to point out real quick that despite the fact you're changing almost everything over the course of the game, it's something directly out of the book that killed half of your team. Well, yeah. So. I know. What I'm saying is I'm trying to ask the question of the people out there, how much do they change campaigns books? How, if you were to run another campaign book, would you go back and actually change things? If more? I was to, if I was to run it again. Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely <laughs> change shit up. Uh, so it, it started out. I wanted to run it pure and right. about halfway, like I said, about halfway through, it works fine. Uh, once you get out into the open world exploration and everything that, you know, and they get a few levels behind them. That's the point I probably should have started changing things, but I was locked in. By God, I wanted to see how this thing plays out the way it's written. Yeah. So I guess coming from my experience writing writing technical documentation and, and writing in, in this kind of manner, the book is written for your average DM with your average player base, and it's, it's written with them in mind. So if you're a really experienced DM, you may find it boring running the, a campaign book without spicing it up some. And I will say that if I had to run, I'm just going to say chapter three, okay, by the book, I would have just been bored out of my skull. Because when you have a single monster of a single monster type, and that's the only thing you have, well, technically they have two, two monster types of, of, a, of a monster tribe, yeah. And that's the only one you use when there's like 30 in the monster manuals. Why? Why are you doing that? Why are you limiting yourself to just two monster types and, and, and a varied group? Now, I know the answer is because they're writing a book and, you know, these two monsters are in the base rules. These two monsters are easy to pick up and find. You don't need to buy the other monster book that has the rest of them in there to run them. 
So, like, I understand that aspect of it, but you definitely do need to take what's there and just shake it around a little bit, change it up a bunch. Or otherwise, the players are going to get bored too. You know, fighting the same monster over and over again. Sure. You know, and but your team blew through that whole area in like a day and a half and didn't do most <laughs> of it. So they probably walk through the door and go, "Oh, is that sixty the same monster?" Yeah, fuck that. Uh, fireball, we're gone. Yeah, and... that's, no, that's literally what it was. It was just fireball, fireball, because there were two people in the party who could fucking do fireball. So, and it's and like you, you can't write books to, to to counter that. Like the one guy who gave me a negative review on my <laughs> because of the fireball, ice table. fireball just beats your whole module. Yeah, 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 because fireball's fucking good at fifth level. It's like yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't i don't i don't i don't i don't mean to be negative if that person's listening to thank you for purchasing my module and playing it i appreciate you but at the same time no shit yeah at, at, fifth level, at fifth level fireball is the most powerful thing in dungeons and dragons that is also true for sixth level by seventh level maybe not so much but and by that time, you can upcast it a few times. So yeah, yeah, it's it still always stays on par. It's just <laughs> not quite as broken by seventh and eighth level. Yeah, I mean eighth level has the ice variant of it <laughs> at third. <laughs> yeah, yeah kind of does. Yeah, yeah. There's always there's variants of it as you go up in the levels. But like the one encounter that I really that I, I assumed was going to take him thirty minutes, it took him three hours to beat a single encounter with a single big bad. I changed that, that encounter up quite a bit because I knew if I just ran it straight from the book, they would have just raffle stomped her and been done with it and just moved on, you yeah. know. And I I wanted to add role play. I wanted to add tension and trauma. I know how my party works. I know if you, I know the Goliath fighter rune knight is the linchpin to the entire party. And if he drops, then the entire party is going to just scatter and fall apart because they lost their tank and their biggest damage dealer. And so someone that's been studying them, you know, would also know this. So they're going to devise a strategy to beat the party, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, like there are definitely some encounters that my players opted to not partake of that would have been incredibly challenging. Even now, you know, they're a couple level, a level or two higher, and it would still be incredibly challenging. Yeah. Uh, so the the book has challenge all the way throughout it. Uh, the most recent encounter was uh, they're they're getting pretty close to the end of the book, and they came across the final fight of the area that they're in and yeah they killed him in the first round that is also because four of them went before him and mm. they hit him with like multiple spells that even if he gets a turn he gets one you know, like one thing he can't move it was like either move reaction or action you can't do all three uh, his dexterity scores were lower from other shit like you know, they just sort of dogpiled up and the barbarian also landed uh two crits back to back yeah so like you know that's just one of those scenarios that sometimes shit just goes wrong as the dm and that's my biggest complaint with fifth edition is 5v1 is not a challenge not usually uh, unless it's a dragon or something like that yeah even 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 a dragon i mean if if, if something stands toe to toe with you then it very it, it just oh, it always loses. Um, I have an uh, example when we were doing Waterdeep and we were doing one of the uh, off book things that you know my party was doing because of of reasons. Cough cough. My wife my wife's drow decided to go slaughter an entire church of good <laughs> drow following Illustray. And we get to the I get to the last boss who's a priest and this is probably the first time I really just kind of noticed this. It was just like, this This is terrible in 5th edition. I had him go up against a priest of Elastre, who was a level 12 priest in the monster manual. I can't remember exactly. But it was a named monster. And the fight went like this. Monk runs up to the person, punches her, stuns her. It's her turn. She's stunned. Everyone else gets on her, dog piles her, the Brazzers logo shows up, and the fight's <laughs> over. And I was just like, this is 
5e1 is just just off in, in Dungeons and Dragons. Always and, has and, been. Always yeah, has been. Yeah, I know it always has been, but there's just no chance. Like I said, unless the monster has some kind of like man, a movement maneuver that can take them out of that situation and put them elsewhere to range them down a little bit and move again to range them down a little bit more and just kite the party around. There's, there's no chance. So, so even, sir- even, even, even in this last game, there was a CR eight mob that fought the party and it got two good rounds in one V one with the Goliath fighter. And it had a Goliath fighter on the ropes, but still took a shit ton of damage from just the Goliath fighter. I gave, I had to give the guy an extra health bar just to make the fight interesting. And I hate doing that. I hate the fact that I have to keep beefing up the monsters or reducing their damage mm-hmm. to, to kind of make them a, a threat or a challenge, not even a threat, even to make them a minor inconvenience, you know? Yeah. And I know that's kind of built into the, the monsters already in 5e where the, they, they, they take half damage from non-magical attacks. Which all, they, which matters a little bit in Icewind Dale. Matters, matters a little bit, but there's so many ways around it. And any good player is going to find a way around it immediately. And you shouldn't be handcuffed behind that. So I gave that guy a hold on their health bar, and they still beat him yeah. handily. 5e, 5e sort of offsets that with uh, lair actions and legendary actions you know, for those guys that you want to actually make challenging. Uh, if you give something a short-range teleport that it can do as a legendary action you know, three times in the course of a round, that makes that fight a lot more fucking challenging. Because then they have to pin that son of a bitch down just to hit him. Right. So yeah, it just... Yeah. But that mob wasn't worthy enough to have legendary or yeah, yeah, yeah. lair actions. Um, most actually of, wouldn't even most been of in the stuff lair. in Icewind Dale is not worthy of having that. So I think uh, our other DM, Eric, he uh, he lets monsters have attacks that are well outside their range. Um, and... I saw that play out in Star Wars a little bit, and I had it was the same kind of issue that I had with giving them a little health bar. It just didn't feel right, you know. Uh, for for my uh, homebrew stuff, I absolutely will do that. Um, you know, I'll give them. I, I prefer to just give them a lot more hit points over giving them ridiculous damage. Either that, or just in general, if I want a fight to be challenging, I'm not going to have a single monster there most of the time. It's going to be multiple things. Uh, one yeah. other thing, one other thing that you can do, and I don't know how well you could do it with Icewind Dale, but encounters don't just have to be monster versus five. You could have a single monster versus five people. What what you do is you add in other stuff like hazards. You know, one v five seems overwhelming, but one v five when the ground is actually lava and that one is immune to lava. Like, that makes that shit a whole lot more challenging for the players. Yeah. But it it takes a lot of setup to get somebody there. Yes, it does. It's not as simple as just, oh, here's your monster, go fight it. You have to think about things, pre-plan them, uh, understand the scenario and how things move. I mean, sometimes if you're having an encounter, there might be a giant walrus sliding around on the ice that might accidentally run over players. Who knows? You didn't didn't watch the stream because I know you hate streams. Yeah. Oh, you did? <laughs> I, had, I had I had it going during that. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, my wife, my 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 wife loved that walrus. Yeah, yeah. And she she we're 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 big fans of that uh claymation from in the the eighties. Yep. yep. Oh crap! What was it? I don't remember, but I know what you're talking about. I've seen it. Anyway, uh, but yeah, like it just if you want encounters to be challenging. But you don't want to change the monster stats, particularly. Just add other stuff that's going on in the background. It's it's Will uh, Vinton's claymation Christmas celebration. <laughs> that is quite <laughs> the name, and I had no idea that was what it was called. Also known as Christmas with the California Raisins. 
uh, yeah, like when, when, when I ran that encounter, I'm not talking about any specifics, but when I ran that encounter with Icewind Dale, I just made sure that mine had a top hat and a handlebar mustache for a walrus. That was fucking important to me. Mine, mine had ice skates and bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, it just, that it, it does always bother me the 5e and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out better ways to handle it and. The second health bar seems to be the best, but it just stretches out the combat. Yeah, it doesn't al- it doesn't alter the outcome even remotely. It just doubles the amount of time it takes. I wish there was something. I know there's mythic actions, which is above lair actions, the mostly in ther- mythic action. They're, it's thero specific. Oh, but it's like the Minotaur or Medusa have mythic actions on top of their legendary actions. Gotcha. Okay. So it's very Theros and Pantheon and yeah, those yeah. kind of legendary monsters. I just wish it was something below legendary actions and just call them like, you know, tough guy, tough guy maneuvers or something well, like that. One thing you can um, do, and I've, I've done this before and I've even seen it before is a lower tier guy will have one legendary action as opposed to the normal three. Yeah, and it's always just extra melee attack after... Well, it doesn't have to be. It can be whatever you as the DM want it to be, so long as it makes sense. You know, obviously a uh, mold or something like that is not going to be teleporting around the... the, Well, I guess it could, but that wouldn't make as much sense. (laughs) Uh, I think we beat that horse dead enough. I'll bring it back up again in a week. Oh yeah, it's, look, we're it's it's a scenario that's never likely to go away, and all especially younger DMs, newer DMs aren't they're not going to know all the little tricks to make encounters more challenging. Like I'm not worried about making Icewind Dale challenging at this point. I just want to play through it and see yeah. what my players do. If they raffle stomp everything from here on forward, so be it. Yep. And just, I would, I would, I would advise playing through Waterdeep. Um, uh, this never happened. Camp- uh, like this is probably the last pre-written campaign I ever run in my life. It's all, it's the first one. It's probably the last one. I'm gonna be honest. I, I, I will say, I will say, run Waterdeep Dragon Ice because it's really fun. And I will say that one was kind of balanced a little bit better for. Uh, the encounter like levels as you start, you start at one and go to you end at like five. It's really short. It's a really short campaign, but there are what I would be interested in you doing would be taking that party, going through the the entire campaign, ending when it ends. Like okay. actually, it's, I think it's seven, and it was where it ends. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you you win, blah blah blah. Not spoilers in case someone hasn't run the almost decade old campaign Just now. Don't um, worry about fucking spoilers for Waterdeep. Let them spend all the money they get. Okay. Let them deck themselves out and then go just straight up run that boss's dungeon that they fought against during the campaign. Because the the entire book is like eight chapters, but the entire campaign is one through four. And right. then five, six, seven, eight is like massive dungeons that are like C or ten plus. So it'd be really interesting to see if your party could go through all of uh, Waterdeep, end at seven, deck themselves out, and then go through one of the big boss uh, dungeons and uh, be successful. Hmm. Because what a lot of people do is they put MacGuffins in each of the those dungeons and then scale it down. So the, there's reason to go there. Yeah. And I think it'd be better if you guys just leave it as it is or even scale it up some and then go in there with a Uber party and see if they can't beat the the story that actually is a cool idea um i yeah because i know it's supposed to be basically the dm you sort of pick a boss and then that's the big bad guy but there's like four options Uh, yeah i know and then each one has their own dungeon that you can run through at the end but if you made them all an option by altering the campaign that could be pretty cool yeah like a lot of people like i said they put MacGuffins because there's this there's a Mm -hmm. door you have to find objects to, to and, and as keys to open up. And so they usually put a MacGuffin from each of those objects in one of those places 
So it's basically just a quick snatch and grab. And you still never fight the end boss in those in those scenarios. Because, you know, without you know, fighting a CR twelve beholder is like ugh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Tier yeah, 15 well, Beholder, whatever, whatever the fuck he is. At level 7, fighting the Xanathar is, is probably a piss-poor idea, let's be honest. But I think I think it'd be great. I think it'd be uh, very entertaining uh, to, to run to run the campaign that way. Yeah, like, I yeah, agree. We, we think you guys can handle him. Just go fight him. Yeah. Okay. Like, like it actually sounds like a fun campaign. My only real problem with it is how, like, I, I have eight million ideas running through my head right now about this upcoming campaign. And mm-hmm. as soon as this campaign is over, I'm gonna have eight million ideas for my next campaign already running through my head. So it's like a never-ending cycle of I already know what I'm running and I know what I want to do. And that water deep one, it's just not ever going to be in there because it's not allowing me that level of creativity I want. My problem is, is I have so much stuff I want to run and I don't have time to do it in. Oh, that's always the case. Yeah. Like I get to play D&D, play and or run one day a week. Uh, We are pretty consistent about it. But yeah, there's just never enough time. Truthfully, I'd love to do this three days a week. uh, But I got other, yeah, you know, I got other shit going on. We all do. I want to do this at a professional level and just just do nothing but this. That's the goal. Yeah, my problem with that it's it's like all things that are hobbies. If you start doing it professionally, it then becomes a job. Well, I mean, there there's some things, and there's some things like uh, like the War Chief Gaming thing that, that that just came out. Sometimes you just need a break and sometimes you can then jump so back in. Why don't it. you go ahead and tell us all about this war chief gaming thing? Fucker, I'm trying to transition properly. I just <laughs> Try, helped you. Tried real hard. I helped so, you. <laughs> so I, when I talked to this about you, you had no idea who Chris Metzen is and I yep. still shame you for that. I still don't care. I, I never would have fucking heard of this guy otherwise. Uh, if you know, it's six months from now, you're going to mention, do you know who Chris Metzen is? And I'm going to be like, I have no clue who that is. <laughs> um, but he, he was the creative developer, uh, for all the classic blizzard stuff that we all know and love. Like he wrote the story to Warcraft. He, I think wrote the story to Starcraft or he had a major hand in it. Did most of the lore stuff for overwatch, you know, and is the voice of Thrall, you know, other, you know, big, Big name when it came to the Blizzard games. And yeah. uh, eventually, the internet being the, being what it is, and some time, and having just having a kid or a second kid or something like that, um, he decided to basically call it quits at Blizzard to spend more time with his family and just recharge his creative juices. And he did that, and he came back with a company called War Chief Gaming. And when I first looked into this, it was just him wanting to somehow bring like tabletop combat, like Warhammer 40k combat to an online virtual session. You know, Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, that's a really neat idea. I hope he gets it off, off the ground. And I paid no more heed to it until this week where they announced that they're releasing their own five E campaign setting. Not like not like with association with D and D, but yeah, it's their homebrew these, stuff. Basically. It's their homebrew stuff that they're releasing. Yeah, be on DM's uh, Guild or Kickstarter or wherever the hell they do it. It's on going to be on Kickstarter. It hasn't released yet. It should come out, I think, this week. Um, and it's basically, I guess, Chris Metzen's home campaign that he ran back in the '80s and '90s, and in book form. So, uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to that. Uh, what was it called again? Uh, I keep I keep saying the name wrong. How the fuck would I know? <laughs> the, the the Ouroboros. I keep oh, saying oh, it. Ouroboros. Yeah, yeah. Ouroboros. Okay, I said it right this time. Yeah, that's so the snake. That's the snake eating the snake. So Ouroboros, Coils of the Serpent, a five E setting by Warchief Gaming. It's on Kickstarter, I think, this week, and uh, I'm interested in it. I'm gonna I'm gonna back it as best I can. I think. Hopefully there's like a section in there that's like, write your own encounters and then 
I write it and they're amazed and they hire me full time as a writer. I, now, look, I, I, I will talk a lot of shit as far as like not running other people's campaigns, but I absolutely will occasionally buy campaigns, read other people's campaign settings and so forth, because it gives me ideas for my own campaign. You know, uh, it's called I, plagiarism. No, it isn't because I'm not writing anything. I'm not selling anything. And taking simplistic ideas and multiplying them, adding upon them is not plagiarism. It's creativity. We had a podcast recently where we said there are no new ideas, just good stolen ideas. I don't remember that podcast. It just sounds like <laughs> plagiarism. And yeah, your yeah. and, and your drow ranger, Dwart, I don't, that sounds like original idea. Have fun with him. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the what? The Drow yeah. Ranger, the yeah, broody. He, yeah, he's he's a uh, dark elf ranger. His name is Dwight. <laughs> Dwight. Uh, <laughs> uh, he has a uh, a uh, pet house cat that runs around with him. Uh, it's a small black cat. <laughs> he can summon it from a statue, or actually, he summons it from a mug, you know, like an empty mug. <laughs> I feel like this guy and Craig would be friends. They'd hang out together, don't you? Yeah. Ugh. Biggity bad. Right. I think we're out. Stop it with that Christ. It's it's only funny because you hate it so much. <laughs> uh, Bye, Craig. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Check us out on Facebook at... There's no at in Facebook. It's just facebook.com forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters. And on Twitter. Uh, that'd be at Grumpy underscore DMs. And on Instagram. At Grumpy Dungeon Masters. And also be sure to follow us on Twitch. Twitch.tv forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters, where we play Rhyme of the Frost Maiden every Saturday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Fuck yeah. <laughs>